I love this text from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. If you need encouragement, this is one of those texts that should just move you in your heart to say, not all is lost. When Paul began his writing here to this church at Corinth, we back it up from the fourth, in the fourth chapter that I just read to you to the beginning of his writing this letter to them. He began his letter at the church of Corinth because Corinth was beginning to be infiltrated by false teachers. So they were teaching all kinds of things that were contrary to what the Apostle Paul was saying about Jesus in, as he journeyed from mission to mission. And so Paul writes very early in this chapter, God in his mercy, Paul said, supplies the strength that is necessary to carry out your ministry despite facing hardships and trials. Do not lose heart, he says. Last week's lesson, we heard about clay pots. And Paul was talking to the Corinthians about being like clay pots. In other words, they were all formed by God in a beautiful way, but they weren't, God wasn't quite finished with them. They needed to be painted. You know how you take a pot and you form it and you mold it and you heat it and it becomes this clay pot. But it needs that glaze over it. It needs that finished luster over it to make it really special. And that's what Paul was saying to the Corinthians. You've been formed by God in a good way, but you're not yet finished with me. You need the luster of the gospel. You need the plan of God's salvation that's still out there waiting for you to culminate in your finally seeing him eye to eye. Now, if you'll just um, forgive me and indulge me a little bit, let me talk to you a little bit about pastoral ministry. You, you've known pastors many, many years in your life and, and the kinds of ministry they do and the job descriptions that congregations give to pastors, but let me just reflect a little bit on pastoral ministry as I tie that into the text this morning. In my pastoral ministry of 50 plus years, and I've joined thousands of other pastors throughout the years of my ministry in all different kinds of Christian denomination, my holy vocation has always been one what I call heart business. Let me tell you what I mean. I've seen and I've experienced a loss of heart many times in congregations over the years. So many congregations get themselves into settings where they lose heart. I've seen that many times over and it just breaks my heart. It breaks your heart too. You ask yourself the question, how many, how many of you in this congregation have been with people who have lost heart? I'm sure all of you in some way or other. Heart business, whether it's your heart business or my heart business as a pastor in the church, it always has its ups and it has its downs. And when I think as a pastor, it's tough to swallow when I've confirmed thousands of kids in my ministry, believe that or not, thousands of kids. And then you look at those kids over all these years and you see some of them just kind of fade away and you wonder, did I really teach them? Or I think of those, maybe this is one of you too, who've been in a divorce setting, tough times. And as those couples come to me for marriage and I sit down with premarital counseling and then I, years later, I run into them and I say, how are you doing? Well, not very good, I'm single now, I'm divorced. That's tough to swallow. If you've been there, you know that feeling. It's tough. When a lesson or the lectionary for a Sunday service or a Saturday service comes to the church and it speaks about the unity of the Spirit and the unity of a congregation, but you just know that somewhere in that congregation there's some mumbling and murmuring going on about an issue in the church and it spreads like fire 
and gossip raises its ugly head. Strong opinions are flying all over and, and they begin to surface, creating anxiety, heart business. Sometimes it's tough. But I can also tell you there's another side to heart business as well. You know, when I, I've had, I, I think I've baptized over 800 children and adults in my ministry. What a heart of joy that's been. And I think of the heart of joy of performing hundreds of weddings and seeing the joy and the smiles on the faces of the bride and the groom and the parents and, and the family and guests that have come. But then sometimes those hearts of joy turn to hearts of pain when you attend a funeral maybe that of your own family, and I as a pastor get to officiate during that painful time. Or the heart of trouble, when families have personal issues with each other and a child goes awry. Someone was here this morning, by the way, and said to me, I remember your daughter. She went to school with my son at St. John's in Lombard. But I haven't seen my daughter in 30 years. Think about that. Troubles like that can come really quickly and they just sneak up on people sometimes and the heart of joy that they once have turns into a heart of problems and that all kinds of family issues settle in. But let me be fair to you as a church member Sometimes you must wonder about us as a pastor when we think things that are different than you think and there's a separation and sometimes the pastor says, well, I know the best way to do this and doesn't rely on congregational intelligence and wisdom and there's a some separation that happens. The possibility of agreement on difficult issues goes awry and they stop listening to one another. It reminds me of the gospel this morning, and the scribes and Jesus were in that very setting, and that's why I bring that up to you, because it's not a new thing. The scribes were working on Jesus in conflict, and they weren't listening to him. And all of a sudden, they started to murmur, and they said, well, he's all part of Beelzebub, who was the chief of all the de de demons and the devil. That's what that word means, Beelzebub, the chief of all the demons in life. And isn't it any wonder that Jesus said to the scribes, Satan cannot cast out himself? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. This morning, St. Paul says to all of us, do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature, our physical part of our life is wasting away and fading away and going into decline, our inner nature is always being renewed by the Holy Spirit that gives us faith to go on day by day. Perhaps there's something we can learn from a church member or maybe a family member that's in a nursing home right now. They're living their life out there. And then every time you and I go into a door of a nursing home to visit somebody we know or maybe a family member, we see people who can no longer work. We see people who are unable to completely dress themselves without help. Sometimes we see people that cannot communicate anymore like they used to communicate daily in life. Sometimes we see people that do not recognize other people and maybe don't even recognize us as a family member. And we can't just give them Prevagen, as the TV wants us to do. I'm not giving a commercial, by the way. Sometimes we just give them a med, as the advertisers always want us to do. Because, you see, advertisers, they always seek to reinforce the thought that the older we get, the less interested people are in us. The older we get, the less contributions we will make in society. 
Is it any wonder today that we have to advocate for our own interests, perhaps in our own health issues? The late mystery writer Agatha Christie, who married H.G. Mellowin, who was a famous archaeologist, she said, you know, there's a tremendous advantage in marrying an archaeologist. For one thing, the older I get, the more interested he gets in me. <laughs> But let's go back into that nursing home for a second. It isn't always a loss of heart. I've seen wonderful things happen to people living in those settings. I once had a member who was 95 years old and he, his wife died and he went off to the Lutheran home in Arlington Heights. And I went to visit him a lot. And one day his son said, you know my dad, he's gonna get married. And I went, he's 95 years old. Well, he found this woman in the nursing home who was 89 years old. And he wanted, he thought he was like 40 years old again. And he wanted to get married. God bless him. And he did marry her. And it turned out okay for the remaining years of their life. But he said to me one day, he said, when, when I was alive, my wife took the reins in my family when it came to religious things because my wife not only raised those children she sent them off to school and got their lunches and did everything and put them to bed and watched them become teenagers and then sent them off in life she did most of that brought them to church and i just kind of sat back and did my thing he said but then when she died i had to make a change in course in my life i had to suddenly take some ownership of my life and so I began to read my Bible every day, faithfully, and to go to church every weekend. If you've been at the Lutheran home in Arlington Heights, they have this beautiful chapel, incidentally. He said, well, I'd go there every, every Sunday, and sometimes I'd go there for special services and whatever. And he said, you know, Pastor, when you come to visit me, and you come to bring me private communion, and when you come to visit me and to pray for me, you give me that inner strength that I need because it reminds me of my congregation that I no longer can be there and the people I knew there and loved there. I know, Pastor, at times I lose heart. Sometimes I get really discouraged and I get really down. But he said, you know what, Pastor, when I die someday... I'm going to go home with the Lord. What a great faith. St. Paul put that man's thinking into words of his own when he wrote his Corinthians, and he said, and Corinthians for us today, by the way, this is what he said, for we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in heavens. And so, my friends, I'm going to ask the Old Testament question of the day, Genesis chapter 3. Where are you? Where are you today? Today's Old Testament lesson tells us of that age-old question of God when he was looking for Adam and he was looking for Eve, and he said, where are you? And Adam said, I was afraid, and so, because I was naked, which was a sign that he was really ashamed of what he had done by eating the fruit of the tree. So I hid from you, Lord. Where are we today? Are we looking for ourselves, all, out for ourselves all the time, or are we deeply grateful to be forgiven children of God? Good questions, isn't it? Are we riding high in life right now? Or are we depressed about a lot of things in life? And it's so easy to do that, isn't it? Are we ready to get revenge on somebody? Or are we ready to be reconciled? Are we too busy to know things in life? Or are we just too worn out to care anymore? Where are we? And God answers the question. 
This is what he says when, you ask, when he asks the question of where are you? Here's the answer. Jesus Christ is the answer to your life. He who was crucified for us and raised again in order to bring us now and in the days, the months, and the years ahead back into a living presence with Jesus face to face. Through his crucifixion, through his resurrection, what he really did was he opened once again Eden's gate that we closed with our sin. And the gospel of Christ's redeeming work assures us and gives us heart and the capabilities that when we do lose heart, our house will not be divided against itself, nor the tent that we live in will go away. Take heart, my dear Christian brothers and sisters. We all go through times of suffering. We all have our afflictions sooner or later. We all have pain. Sometimes we have brokenheartedness, and we surely are living in a very messy, troublesome time right now. And if you're getting older like I am, and you look at yourself, and you watch what happens to your body over the years, as it slowly goes in a different direction. There is forgiveness, and there is hope, and there is the promise that we have a building from God, as Paul says, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. But until we get there, we have a Lord who leads us and strengthens us with his word and his sacrament, that which Paul began his words in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 when he said, we have a ministry of mercy from God. We have a ministry to give out to others from our Christian life. We have a ministry of heart business that helps us not to lose heart, but to keep the faith in Christ Jesus, our Savior, our Sanctifier, our Healer, and our coming King. Keep that faith, dear brothers and sisters, and God bless you as you do. Amen.